This week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we covered the Chicago Tylenol murders, a case unlike anything we've seen on this show before. At the time, the case was the center of a national media circus. Some may even say frenzy. Okay, yeah. you're welcome to. It's an interesting case. That's what I'm trying to get at here. Illinois is known for soybeans and poison medicine. And Shane Madej. And me! The nation's greatest tragedy. Uh huh. Let's get into it. Okay. On September 29th, 1982, seven people in the Chicago area ingested poison Tylenol pills, consequently collapsing and dying shortly after. The victims included 12-year-old Mary Kellerman, 27-year-old Mary Reiner, 31-year-old Mary McFarland, 35-year-old Paula Prince, 27-year-old Adam Janus, 25-year-old Stanley Janus, and 19-year-old Teresa Janus. The last three were unfortunately all from the same family. Adam Janus collapsed after ingesting extra-strength Tylenol. He was rushed to the hospital where he died. When the family returned home to mourn, both Adam's brother Stanley and Stanley's wife Teresa took a Tylenol, resulting in both of their deaths, making it three deaths in the same family on the same day. Oh no! Yeah, I, that's what I was saying. It get, it's so much worse than you would think. The fact that all three of the Janus's died in the same house would eventually lead to investigators connecting the dots. On the night of the 29th, Cook County investigator Nick Pichos compared the Janus's Tylenol bottle to the bottle from another victim named Mary Kellerman. Once Pichos had both bottles, he noticed that they shared one similarity, a control number, MC2880. Deputy Medical Examiner Donahue says he told Pichos to smell the bottles, and Pichos remembers that they both smelled like almonds, and cyanide is said to smell like bitter almonds. Exposure to a large dose of cyanide by any method can lead to seizures, cardiac arrest, and respiratory failure. Blood test results would show that the victims had taken a dose that was 100 or even 1,000 times the lethal amount. This, this boogeyman is very thorough. Perhaps too thorough, maybe even careless. You think he got lazy and was like, oh, I'm gonna make like thousands of these pills, and he got through like five of them, and he's like, this is fucking hard. Yeah. I think I'm just, you know, I just put them all in one. Could have been 7,000, I guess. It could have been 7,000. I guess we're lucky he got lazy. Yeah. Deputy Medical Examiner Donahue says he spoke with an attorney for Johnson & Johnson, Tylenol's manufacturer parent company. By the evening of October 1st, after all seven victims had died, authorities were fairly certain the Tylenol had intentionally been poisoned with potassium cyanide by someone. Late that night, it was announced that all Tylenol would be pulled from the shelves. Immediately, McNeil Consumer Products, the subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson that manufactured Tylenol, recalled over 31 million bottles of Tylenol and issued warnings. They also offered to replace recalled bottles with new bottles and put up a $100,000 reward for anybody with information about the person who had done this. These precautions were estimated to have cost the company roughly $100 million. I mean, because before this point, they did not have... No, like the, seals on the bottles, well, right? This case was the it's reason what, why tamper-proof seals were created. The greatest safety precautions of our time are um, f written in blood. That's actually that's pretty true. It's accurate. I can't think of one instance where that where we were smart enough to take the the precedent. No, it's usually just well, scrub off all the guts over there, and I guess let's put a cross guard there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> By Tuesday, October 5th, the U.S. Attorney General as well as the FBI were on the case, in addition to local authorities. Tyrone Fawner, Illinois State Attorney General, says he believes in the initial stages there were about 1,200 actual leads. It's estimated that U.S. newspapers ran over 100,000 separate articles about the incident. A nationwide panic ensued. People who believed they might have been poisoned overwhelmed hospitals and poison control call centers. CPD actually went throughout the city giving warnings about Tylenol through loudspeakers. Whoa! So this is like straight up like end of day shit yeah. going on in Chicago. That's pretty good. Actually not Chicago, the whole world. Whole I mean, world. Not the whole, or at least America. Yeah. I'd quarantine myself, I think. I don't think you would have to do, oh, you mean t t so that you weren't affected by yeah, anything? Yeah, you don't know if it's airborne. You don't know if this is like, this could be the beginning of the zombie apocalypse in my mind. Though I have daydreamed about having an am uh, amazing bunker that has like satellite TV. And yeah, stuff that'd be like pretty that. baller. I'd I be guess a... satellite TV wouldn't really matter. Get some. If there was a, a 
apocalypse. No. There were a slew of copycat product tampering incidents according to the FDA about 270 of them just in the month after the Tylenol murders. Some copycats of them also poisoned pills with things like rat poison and hydrochloric acid. One fact that baffled police initially was that all of the victims bought their Tylenol from different stores, and those stores got their Tylenol from different production plants. Spooky. How could that even be possible? I could see why they were baffled by that. Labs were set up and capsules began to come through for testing. Over 10 million recalled pills were tested. In total, 50 capsules were found to contain cyanide across eight bottles. Five of these bottles belonged to the victims. Two of these bottles were sent back in the recall. And chillingly, one bottle was found sitting on a shelf, still unsold. No fingerprints or other physical evidence was found. There was also no evidence clearly showing the killer's trail in the stores, as surveillance cameras were not as common then. Investigators explored the possibility of this being a white-collar crime syndicate, intent on tanking Johnson & Johnson's stock. In fact, Tylenol's share of the non-prescription pain reliever market plummeted from 35% to 8% after the murders. Investigators also looked into every disgruntled employee who worked or had worked where the tainted Tylenol was made, stored, or sold. Do you think Advil was behind this? No, I don't think Advil was <laughs> Is this Big Advil? No. I don't think Big Advil. I'm not, I'm not slandering the company of Advil. Big Advil I use sounds your... like a shitty indie band. <laughs> the latest release from Big Advil. You see the Big Advils and the new Coachella, Coachella lineup? <laughs> Any shoplifters who had been caught at the drugstores where the poison Tylenol was found were reevaluated. Those who had just been released from prison or psychiatric hospitals around Chicago were interrogated. The police publicized the victims' funerals, hoping the killer would show up at one of them. Eventually, the police reached the theory that whoever did this visited the various stores, purchased the Tylenol, planted the potassium cyanide in the capsules, placed those pills back in the bottle, and then returned the bottles around September 28th. This would be one day before the first deaths occurred. Their reasoning was that the cyanide would eventually eat through the capsules, so whoever committed the crime would have to do it close to when the capsules were purchased and consumed, and would therefore have to have done it in Chicago. We always refer to the Wild West as, you know, just being this crazy time of crime. You could actually get away with a lot of shit in a... Wild West was the 80s. A couple, yeah, essentially, you could, it's a couple decades ago, you could get away with a bunch of shit. Walk into a store, pocket a cola. You could pocket a cola, punch the guy in the face. Yeah, and be and like... And then be like, um, see you later. My name's Shane Bidet, <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> Cops wouldn't get to your door for weeks. Yeah, fingerprinting wasn't really around that much. No. Uh, there was no surveillance cameras. They'd have to go off a description, and for you, it'd be tall white guy with a large head, and that's yeah. a lot of people in Chicago, that's a I imagine. lot of people in Chicago. Let's get into the suspects. The first suspect is 48-year-old dock worker Roger Arnold, who said some suspicious things about the Tylenol murders at a bar one night. The police questioned him and searched his home. They turned up several interesting connections. Roger Arnold worked at a jewel warehouse with the father of one of the victims named Mary Reiner. Adam Janus, another victim, had purchased his Tylenol from a jewel convenience store. According to the New York Times, the store where Mary Reiner bought her fatal pills was actually across the street from where Roger Arnold's wife's psychiatric ward was located. How-to crime manuals were found in Arnold's home. Police also found evidence of chemistry in Arnold's home, such as beakers and other equipment, as well as a bag of powder. Though, the powder was tested and it turned out to be potassium carbonate, not cyanide. Roger Arnold also refused to take a lie detector test, and the police never found enough to prosecute him. In June of 1983, the following year, Arnold shot an innocent man named John Stanisha outside of a bar late one night. Arnold did so under the impression that Stanisha had turned Arnold into the police for his suspicious comments at the bar, which he hadn't. Stanisha died, and Arnold was sentenced to 30 years, but got out early on parole. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of his connections to the case seem circ uh, circumstantial. Uh, I mean, there's how-to crime manuals in his house, there's chemistry there. I mean, it, it just said how-to crime? No, like, I don't think it was titled how-to crime. Oh. There were manuals of how-to. If he had a book called how-to crime. How-to crime. <laughs> then there, there's your guy. Yeah, it was written in crayon. The second suspect is Theodore J. Kaczynski, AKA the Unabomber, a once brilliant mathematician 
Kaczynski is currently serving life in prison for killing three people and wounding 23 others with bombs sent through the mail. Oh, hey, ha yeah, this guy's, he's crazy. Yeah, he's out there in the character universe. Everybody knows who he is. Here's the thing, this goes back to what we've talked about in the past, that people seem to think that serial killers are all like in this character universe. Yeah, he's can... for sure in the serial killer's Avengers. Even though he's not a serial killer, there is no, he's just sort of a terrorist. There, there's no serial killer character universe. All right, anyways. Here are some things that match up with the Tylenol killings. Kaczynski is an Illinois native, and his first bomb was found in Chicago, where he lived at the time. As you already know, all seven killings occurred within Illinois. However, one Tylenol death that is not official is the cyanide poisoning via extra strength Tylenol of J. Adam Mitchell in Sheridan, Wyoming, that occurred a little over two months before the Illinois Tylenol killings. This is noteworthy because Sheridan, Wyoming is a town on the way to Kaczynski's cabin in Montana, where he lived at the time of the killings. Kaczynski's victims also had connections to Wood. For instance, one of the surviving victims was named Percy Woods, who resided in Lake Forest, Illinois. Another victim was Gilbert Murray, president of the California Forestry Association. Furthermore, Kaczynski's bombs were partially made of wood, and he often used return addresses and pseudonyms involving types of wood in the past. One example was Frederick Benjamin Isaac Wood, with an address of 549 Wood Street in Woodlake, California. Not super creative. Yeah, I'll tell you why this is, this is all relevant. Why I'm talking about wood so much, I'm about to spill that. Oh, let's spill yeah, I'm about to drop a bomb right now. Drop that bomb, oh, I see. Get You're on brand here with the bombing. Bomb, Unabomber. No, I, I didn't even No, it was that. very good. Yeah, okay, sure, I'll take it. This is relevant because two of the three founders of Johnson & Johnson have the middle name Wood. Oh, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm good. No, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. A bit of a reach. Not really, it's his calling card. He's the Wood guy. Admittedly, those seem like thin connections, but in February 2009, the FBI office in Chicago announced that it would use advancements in forensic technology in a review of all evidence relevant to the Tylenol killings. The FBI requested a DNA sample from Kaczynski. Here's Kaczynski in his own words. Quote, the officer said the FBI was prepared to get a court order to compel me to provide the DNA sample, but wanted to know whether I would provide the sample voluntarily. End quote. Kaczynski wrote that he was willing to provide the sample on one condition that the courts not allow the United States Marshals Service to conduct an auction of Kaczynski's belongings. Here's his reason why. Quote, even on the assumption that the FBI is entirely honest, an assumption I'm unwilling to make, partial DNA profiles can throw suspicion on persons who are entirely innocent. For example, such profiles can show that 5% or 3% or 1% of Americans have the same partial profile as the person who committed a certain crime." End quote. He then goes on to say that if a match were to occur, quote, some of the evidence seized from my cabin in 1996 may turn out to be important. End quote. In summation, Kaczynski believed that the items up for auction may be crucial in proving he never owned potassium cyanide. Regardless, the auction went forward as planned, and Kaczynski declined to give his DNA voluntarily. I'm trying to think of how I'm gonna phrase this where I don't sound like a psychopath. Good luck. <laughs> if they're gonna conduct an investigation of him as an official suspect for the Tylenol killings, it makes sense that they wouldn't auction off all of his shit so they could actually conduct a thorough investigation. Otherwise, they're gonna be like, Oh, you know what? We'll just have to cross-reference this with the typewriter he used. Oh wait, we sold it to some old lady in Florida. Fuck. Some old lady in Florida bought the Unabomber's typewriter? I don't know. Oh. It could be anybody. Oh, okay. But my point is, if they wanted to cross-reference cross evidence and go back and look at things, they wouldn't be able to do that if they fucking sold all of his shit. The third and prime suspect was tax accountant James Lewis. On Wednesday, October 6th, one week after the first deaths, Johnson & Johnson received a photocopy of a handwritten unsigned letter. On this letter, the FBI found fingerprints of James Lewis. The letter reads, quote, Johnson & Johnson, parent of McNeil Laboratories. Gentlemen, 
As you can see, it is easy to place cyanide, both potassium and sodium, into capsules sitting on store shelves. And since the cyanide is inside the gelatin, it is easy to get buyers to swallow the bitter pill. Another beauty is that cyanide operates quickly. It takes so very little, and there will be no time to take countermeasures. If you don't mind the publicity of these little capsules, then do nothing. So far, I've spent less than $50, and it takes me less than 10 minutes per bottle. If you want to stop the killing, then wire $1 million to bank account number 84495970 at Continental Illinois Bank, Chicago, Illinois. Don't attempt to involve the FBI or local Chicago authorities with this letter. A couple of phone calls by me will undo anything you can possibly do." End quote. As mentioned before, James Lewis's fingerprints were found on this letter. A warrant for his arrest was issued, and the ensuing manhunt would end on December 13th, after Lewis was spotted at a New York Public Library annex. So James Lewis, by the way, he's the guy whose fingerprints were found on this letter, who wrote this letter. And they spotted him at the library reading, How to Crime? <laughs> Strangely, the bank account number listed in Lewis's letter did not belong to Lewis, but instead belonged to a man named Frederick Miller McKay, a man who Lewis believed had stiffed his wife Leanne out of $511 in change. Basically, Lewis only included McKay's bank account number in hopes that it would expose this $511 theft, and ultimately had nothing to do with the murders and was as petty as it was idiotic. Seems like a long way to go for a, a gag. Lot. That's a lot to do. You can't, he doesn't even think like, oh, maybe the feds will be angry at me on this one. <laughs> you think this was like an anniversary gift for his wife? I don't know. I don't know what he could have done to He's make like, I did, I did a real sweet thing for you. Honey. Maybe he was really in the doghouse and he was just desperate for any kind of turn of affection from her. So he I thought, know what I'll do. <laughs> I know what I'll do. I'll write the FBI. That being said, Lewis's past did lead investigators to suspect that he could be the Tylenol killer. He allegedly chased his mother with an ax when he was 19. Not great. <laughs> no, no, off, off to no a bad good. start. I've never done that. You didn't do that, did you? No, I didn't. What, is there anything to suggest that I would chase my mom with an ax? Not outright. I feel like if you Not peel the outright. layers back. You think you peel the layers back from this onion, you'll see something you don't want to see? Yeah, I think you wear a mask sometimes. Mm. I think you should keep digging and maybe see what happens. Oh, no, I'm good. In 1966, he was committed to the Missouri State Mental Hospital after taking 36 anison pills. There, he was diagnosed with catatonic schizophrenia. Later, he tried to explain that both of these events were attempts to avoid the Vietnam draft. Later in his life, Lewis was charged and acquitted for the murder of a man named Raymond West, who had been found dismembered in his own home in the summer of 1978. After that, Lewis and his wife launched a short-lived business venture attempting to import pill-making machines made in India. In 1981, Lewis was suspected for falsifying credit card applications using fake addresses and mailboxes. In a search of Lewis's home on December 4th, 1981, the police did find plenty of evidence to arrest Lewis for these particular crimes. As a result, Lewis and his wife fled to Chicago, where they lived under assumed names for almost a year, bringing us to the timeline of the Tylenol murders. However, the Lewises bought Amtrak tickets from Chicago to New York City on September 4th, 1982, which was 25 days before the Tylenol deaths began. And if you recall, the Tylenol killer would have to plant the cyanide within close proximity of the consumption date, and 25 days was too long. But some investigators on the original case believed it would have been possible for the perpetrator to fly into O'Hare Airport, rent a car, plant the poison, and leave Chicago. Can you imagine just, just going home to your wife and being like, hey, I've got an idea. It's a little weird. <laughs> and sh she just goes, well, sounds good. Yeah, I know. Like, these are two messed up weirdos Unless who have she's... found each other, and it's almost a shockingly beautiful love story. Surveillance video from one of the drugstores did show a bearded man who some thought looked a lot like Lewis, but there was no positive ID, 
and nobody could place Lewis in Chicago shortly before the deaths. He's got just a bag full of mailboxes and beards. And, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. He's a regular criminal carrot top. Yeah. He's got a whole little case full of things and like little intricacies. <laughs> a little, little horn. Honk, yeah. Honk. Horn, Elmer's glue, we're good to go. I just cut up an old man. Honk, honk. <laughs> Ultimately, authorities never even had enough to prosecute Lewis, let alone convict him of the murders. However, Lewis's letter writing fiasco did lead to him being convicted of extortion. Lewis was sentenced to 20 years in prison, but served a little less than 13. While in prison, Lewis bizarrely offered his help and explained and drew in detail how someone might go about injecting the capsules with lethal amounts of cyanide. Lewis was released in 1995 and he and his wife now live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. In 2010, James Lewis published a book titled Poison, The Doctor's Dilemma. Lewis would insist that the book had nothing to do with the Tylenol murders, and also stated that he regretted sending the police the ransom note. The fictional plot of the book is about death by water poisoned with lead in Southern Missouri. When he went on public access television in January 2010 to promote his book, he ended up giving a 48-minute interview in which many of the questions were directed at his role in the 1982 Tylenol murders. Lewis referred everyone to his lawyer and refused to comment further. I just want to talk about my book about poison, not about... <laughs> I don't get it. I just want to talk about my work. And uh, everyone just keeps seeming to bring up all my past of all the shitty stuff I've done. No, we're good. Ugh, this guy's gross. One positive thing to come of the case came from the FDA and Johnson & Johnson, who together created the tamper-proof foil seals that we now use to determine if containers have been tampered with. I do think it's possible that someone could have flown in, did a little day trip, plant some pills and go back home. I mean, it's not that crazy to me. Obviously, this person has a way with uh, fooling the police. It must have been fun to be a criminal in the 80s. <laughs> Everything before the 80s. Just lawless. Yeah, it's true. My takeaway is people from Chicago are weird. This does not represent Chicago. This is people don't go, hey, Chicago, Tylenol murders. <laughs> Home with the Bean, the Cubs, and the Chicago Tylenol murders. <laughs> and of course, our nation's greatest tragedy, Shane Madej. That's not, that's not me. I'm, I'm not. I read it somewhere. You didn't read it. You probably wrote it. Yeah. <laughs> In the end, nobody really knows who the Tylenol killer was or why he or she did it. What truly transpired on that one fateful day in Chicago continues to baffle, and the case remains unsolved. <laughs>